not a fucking mermaid. <laughs> and that moment when Jim drops, he was your friend. Like, yeah. I'm like, you mm -hmm. see, I believe it. There's a lot of rich potential in how uh, parallels between how Jim was raised versus how some of our other leads were that we know were raised. And have Izzy help train them how to fight in other ways. I think there's several <laughs> fix in that. And I think some good Samaritan should write them for us. Welcome back to the Our Flag Means Fan Fiction Podcast. This is episode four. We now have listeners in 24 different countries. We were actually hovering at 23 countries for a while, and Mexico was the most recent one to enter the fold. This is exciting because I feel like four episodes, this is like a real podcast now with each episode at like 90 minutes in running time. By the time this episode four reaches your ears, we will officially have six full hours of our flag related entertainment content. And to put that into perspective, the runtime of this podcast is now longer than the runtime of season one of the show, which is wow. insane. <laughs> Right. So if you're planning a road trip, this podcast will actually keep you entertained all the way from Los Angeles to San Francisco. The Our Flag show, unfortunately, has now been in the gravy basket for over a month. So sad. And there's been a, but there's been a lot of news in the fandom. Last night, Vico performed at Them Fatale and Lacey, who might be joining us later, was there. Lacey, it was is it, Them Fatale it was a drag show. Lacey said it was a great old good time. We saw some great picks. Rosie, the other Rosie, not the Rosie who's on the podcast, but Rosie, Reese's wife, uh, shared selfies. So that was all very wholesome. The, David Jenkins broke his silence on Thursday, February 8th, like after like 20 days of not being on social media, retweeting at Gay and Woke, who posted an analysis of the meaning of the Our Flag Means Death title. And David retweeted it saying, just thought it sounded cool, but I love this analysis. Of course, everyone will take a, a, an excuse, a reason to clown. And it kind of went off from there. Uh, I have been watching People of Earth, which is David Jenkins' first show. And it is, um, have you guys watched this show? This show is amazing. This is brand new information to me. I did not know he had another show. I feel like oh, a bad yeah. fan. <laughs> oh my I've God. I've heard really good things. I have not watched it, but I have been told to. I think when I'm in a more like stable place for David Jenkins content, maybe it'll feel good. But I've heard like really warm, excited things. I just, I remember like a they had a booth or something at Comic-Con years ago. Like I never watched the oh, show, wow. but I saw that and I was like, that looks cool. That looks, that looks like fun. I'm definitely going to watch it. I had no idea. I for some reason I thought our flag was like his debut as a like showrunner and stuff. Let me tell you, I'm gonna be evangelical about this show. <laughs> the show, if I had known about it in 2016 when it aired, I it would have been my whole identity. There's so many parallels to our flag. Um, my favorite character in the show is he wears his long hair up in a bun um when he's has a crush on this girl and he's trying to woo her, and little tendrils hang down so i'm like that is the origin of the ed updo it's so beautiful he's so beautiful he's very blonde and just he's so dumb and innocent well if there's one thing we all love it's an idiot so he's and it's great. so cute so what no. i'm hearing is that we need to start a campaign for everyone to go watch the show and earn david jenkins some uh residuals but the thing is you have to buy it on amazon you can't just oh. stream it for free mm. anywhere you so i i I forked out 1999. So what I'm hearing for those of us who are poor is we're going to have a hangout night at Carly. Yeah. <laughs> to watch yeah. The since show. I hang out at my house, come over Tony and we'll watch it. <laughs> we'll watch. So I bought both seasons. So 1999. So that means I spent $40 towards david jenkins residuals <laughs> and i it's money well spent it is so good uh so there's also a jeff <laughs> wow oh. is he an accountant wow is he yeah, is he an accountant <laughs> jeff is like the middle manager 
of this alien abduction spaceship thing and he's like okay so this is like an alien abduction show yeah yes he's like a little gray alien well this is great because now i can write it off on my taxes as a business expense i know we're gonna talk about research for my my next project yeah (laughs) um and jeff gives izzy vibes in a big Mm. way um there's also I, I feel like it's I'll have to compare the two shots, but you know, in season two, where Steed and Steed pulls Ed into his room up against the wall. Kisses. No, Carly, none of us watched that no. on repeat. What are you talking about? <laughs> you talk- yeah, I, <laughs> Not one of us knows what you're talking about. <laughs> that exact same blocking happens. And you're like, We're you watch it. something about David Jenkins. I right know. Now. <laughs> Was it, is it a street moment in, in People of Earth? Or yeah, unfortunately, it's, it's very hetero. Well, I love, I love that he's like, well, we did. I love that move, but like, let's repeat that. Like, he, oh, but oh my gayer. god, we'll make it fruity oh, this time. Spectacular! I love a good wall press, a good like <laughs> grab them by the lapels, um, and I love that that's like a trend with him. I also love the idea that you rec- can recognize the like the top bun with the little uh-huh. strands because that is an excellent look, and I just love that that is something that you can recognize because it is a good look. He's very feminine. And- yeah. I love that in a man. (laughs) Love that in a man. Um, There's also a beard cleaning moment. So there's a moment Mm. where a character um, says you have a little something on your beard and then pulls it off the beard. And then they have an eye connecting uh, moment. What I'm hearing is we're all going to go watch this immediately (laughs) after this. (laughs) Yeah. And also that like did Reese watch that and then was like, oh, you've got you've got something in your beard. You know? Like yeah, the, I don't know because I we know that 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 was like an improvised scene between um, Taika and Reese, but maybe the the beard cleaning moment was in the script. Yeah, maybe uh, the, that specifically, or like I love the idea that like Reese has watched People of Earth and was like, "Yes, that was a great moment." But also, just in general, the beard, ah, cl- oh, just so good. Beard cleaning, so good. Ah, Carly just joined us. The other Carly in the Southern Hemisphere, Carly. Um, This is good because I told Carly to pop on because you're like our live correspondent. Oh, fantastic. Um, Because you can report live from the big news that happened today. You did the boat thing. I forget what the boat thing. I forget what the official title was. Uh, The official title is, um, well, so we went at the star of india in san diego california and it was safe spaceship as the hashtag that we're hoping yes. to safe spaceship <laughs> and that was which is, which is a great synchronicity by the way because we were just talking about people of earth okay tell us all about the Love event what happened oh it was just really fun we figured we would like to uh, have some kind of a ship representation as we're trying to get season three um adopted by anyone else um so we just happened to ha- live right next to the fucking ocean and happened to have access to these piratey type ships so uh there was a total of it was a it was small there was seven of us there um and then two little stragglers who got really shy and didn't actually want to come <laughs> on board um at the very last minute, it was really cute, but we like looped them in a little later. So about nine of us there that showed up as gay pirate friends wanting to make a little bit of noise for the show. It was pretty cute. It was a great setup. Like we have totally come on down to San Diego and check it out. Oh, gosh. I'm, I'm sure great photos. A lot of great time. photos. Yeah, okay. processing those now. <laughs> and, and lots of good cosplay. Um, yeah, I was uh, there were three of us covered in cosplay. Um, Katie rolled in and uh, was wearing some really beautiful like uh a rendition of the depression robe the future uh, depression robe and um then we had my fellow coordinator of the event came in as a little low-key steed so i was low-key ed they were low-key steed and then we had the depression robe representation it was it was nice everyone else had, had like really cute like homemade uh queer pirate gear and you have really great black makeup on right now so oh, you're yeah, yeah. really doing your ed as the kraken Sort of I really happening. thought that you were just wearing sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> and to segue, we should describe what everyone's wearing because we also have a uh, nerdy. I haven't even introduced everyone, but when we introduce you, uh, nerdy, tragically nerdy on AO3 is here wearing the oranges. So we that we got the show representation here. Any other show uh, representation happening? Maya's got the earrings. Right? Ah, assigned knives at birth. So Maya, yeah, and then I have my 
Jim Earrings also. Ah, uh, the Lil Jimenez dagger in the orange. Uh, mm. Represent, so, hey. Love oh, yeah. it. <laughs> Love it. Thank you. So Maya is wearing the assigned knives at birth and the Jim dagger. Excellent. Um, Did you see my Kraken belt? Oh, uh, you got a belt. Okay. So Carly's showing off a belt <laughs> with a octopus, like as the belt buckle. It's mm-hmm, really mm-hmm. cool. Really it's cool. It's pretty badass, I gotta say. Which is a good segue to on Tuesday, probably a day after this episode drops, uh, will be the WB Metalotage Processional. Did I pronounce that right? I, don't think I, did. <laughs> I think that's what we came up with last round. Yes, Metalotage. Um, <laughs> so looking forward to meeting some pirates there. I will, I think I've decided, uh, I have like a, a, a feminine Lucius season one outfit. And then I also have this white outfit that is, I, 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 I wore it originally for a Hamilton cosplay, mm. um, you know, the corset, the white. So it's going to be a uh, femme Lucius in the Republic of Pirates. That um, sounds amazing. Yeah. So because I figure I have really good Lucius hair right now. Yeah, you do. You do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So Are I'm like, I'm just going to be blood yeah. stains. No, no, I'm not going to do blood stains because I'm <laughs> it's it's very pretty. It's a cor- it's a white corset <laughs> with like. Yeah, I just I wasn't sure what what level of commitment. Right, we're going with like, here. <laughs> some red felt you can pin to it or something. Oh, like that's that. a good idea. <laughs> that is a good idea. I do also need to get like a notebook for uh, Lucius Fem Lucius to carry. So, well, I I do have some building on this to go. Should print some fan fiction to put in it. I know. <laughs> print some fan. I know, right? Okay. So the other uh, cool thing that's dropping this week on. Apple Plus, there's this show called The Completely Made Up Adventures of Dick Turpin, which is giving huge Our Flag vibes. And I was excited. Did you guys see the trailer for this? Mm-hmm. Oh, oh my God. Okay, let's do a live <laughs> watch of, of the Dick Turpin trailer. Hold on a second. Let me pull it up. Is it gay? I hope so. I Googled right I mean, after I pirates, saw this. Right? So it feels like probably. I know what you're thinking. Who is this guy with the incredible cheekbones? Where does he get his hair done? I already know Wonder. who the actor is. The most oh, oh, yes. In all of oh, yeah. You Love no. literally about mm-hmm. to be hanged, you idiot. Quick note to my gang. If you were planning a rescue, now would be a good time. I want this dick in my hands as soon as possible. Yeah. <laughs> That sounds weird. Yeah, that did sound a bit weird. Sorry. <laughs> okay, like it sounds gay, but probably <laughs> won't be, you know? <laughs> Oh, is it yeah. going to be like one of those, like the teases that's at the cusp of, but not over? Yeah. That's oh. what I thought this would be. So you never oh. know. It's true. It's true. Let's pray to the gay gods that it ends yes. up being gay. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome more gay into the world for sure. <laughs> okay. So in other reasons to clown, Valspar, the interior paint company announced the 2024 color of the year is Renew Blue. And ah! the blue <laughs> color they chose is like the same blue color as Steed's coat. Oh, amazing. Hmm. That seemed like a sign from the universe. Or I could not figure out where you were going with that when you yeah. said, speaking of reasons to clown, and then said something about a paint company. I was like, surely this has a, <laughs> a direction. And it did. Uh, and then I, I guess the biggest news is that Reese is now on Cameo doing personalized uh, Cameo uh, videos for people. And some folks are crowdfunding and getting uh, Reese Cameo videos. They are extremely wholesome. I've been like watching every single one of them. Have you guys seen these? I've seen a couple of snippets. Yeah, really, really wholesome uh, little uh, videos. Definitely check them out. So uh, there was a um, Wee John Monday, which was very delightful. And Leslie Jones. One day. In. Yeah, Wee John Monday. Mm. I couldn't say it. <laughs> so it was very wholesome. There's been some good behind the scenes content with uh, Vico and David Fang. Um, a bunch of New York Save Our Flag Means Death bus ads, which David posted a photo of the bus ad yesterday on his Instagram, along with the song Candle in the Wind, which made people freak out a bit because Candle in the Wind was written by Elton John went as like a tribute to Marilyn Monroe and like a life 
cut short and then it was used again when Princess Diana died. So it's all about like a life cut short. And people were reading into that, that that was like a sign, like the hinting that it was over and there's no more possibility of season three. Uh, But people also pointed out that David played that song in a like thread, a Twitter thread where he said, RIP Lucius. Basically, we can't really put too much meaning either way. What I'm hearing here is that David Zaslav pushed our flag means death off the boat, but it's going to be okay because auntie will save us. (laughs) Yes. There you go. (laughs) Yeah. But we might be missing a thumb or a finger at that point. That's just fine. (laughs) Yeah. We don't need thumbs. Yeah. Cats don't have them. We don't need them. We don't need them. There was also (laughs) this um, new Max Spin article that was terrible. I lost the (laughs) link. I didn't even bookmark it. But it said there was this quote in the article that said something Mm -hmm. about how our flag was never going to be a part of the awards season conversation. And that pissed Mm -hmm. me off, first Mm -hmm. of all, because in order to make your show get nominated for the all the big awards like the emmy you know and uh, it, the emmys aren't even like for this show isn't even for next year so don't even worry about it. before the golden globes like the sag awards and all that what happens is the companies have to not just do for your consideration ads they have to do industry stream industry screenings and q and a's and i mean i've gotten to be a part of these industry screenings and it makes a huge difference when you're in the room with the creators and the actors after watching their thing. And then they're talking about the work they did on it. And like, even if you, you watch something and you're like, Oh, I'm not, I'm not super into this. But when you hear like the creators talk about it, it, you're like, Oh, I want them to win. Yes. I'll vote for them. Yes. I'll nominate them. So it makes a huge difference. So The reason that our flag maybe isn't getting as many award nominations as it should is because there haven't been any industry screenings or Q and A's. We have all, all of us in LA and in the industry have been looking for these screenings and Q and A's and we have not found any anywhere. So, and this is something that's been going on pretty much since like November after the strike ended. Um, industry screenings left and right, none for our flag. So it's the show certainly deserves it. Rosie just posted in the chat, the more I hear about Hollywood, the more it sounds like publishing, which is it's just so bad. Everything's made up. It's like the New York Times bestseller list. In order to get on yeah. the New York Times bestseller list, you have Your to publisher have- has to call the New York Times and be like, hey, this book, pay attention. If they don't call, it doesn't matter if you have the numbers. So it's and like, I- similar. It always reminds me of that quote from The Devil Wears Prada, where Meryl Streep is like, the people in this room chose that color blue sweater for you. And you thought you were being subversive by buying it at a thrift store. But like, we made this choice. And that's how it feels with media. The media that we consume, the media that is popular, that is put forth as like awards worthy and everything, it's chosen for us by people in a room who decide what media they think we're going to like. And then they put the money into advertising that media And then that media is watched more. And so when a show like this takes off the way that it did in such an organic way with just like a grassroots sort of like viewer enthusiasm, they don't expect it and they don't know what to do with it. And it actually disrupts their plan for what should be successful and how successful it should be. Mm. And they don't like that. And so, you know, they want to push us off the boat. And it's a, a really great example is People of Earth. God, this show is so good. And Mm. this show is like um, The Good Place in that type of comedy, type of philosophical uh, weirdness, feeling, interesting characters, interesting dynamics, relationships, and uh, makes you feel things in like a really, you know, big way. And I just feel like People of Earth could have been The Good Place. It didn't get that chance because it just never got the promotion. And if it had been on Netflix, maybe it might have been. I don't know. But People never, I didn't know about it. If I knew about it, God, I would have been, I would have been obsessed back then. And I hear that when I tell people about our flag, especially after the first season where they're like, wait, that show is about what? I would have loved to watch that. Oh my God, Taika. Oh my God. Like this yeah. character from Game of Thrones and this actor, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And you mean it's funny, as funny as The Office, but funnier, queerer, like as so 
anti-colonialist like wow i wish i'd heard of this because they had like two posters that did not get at the tone of the show um yeah. that were posted in places for like two days for a minute um and i think it just like i think over and over again uh they've shown that they don't care why we like it they've shown that they've decided already what the budget is what the fallout is and they're like we gave you your show you had your gay thing now we're going to continue and i've i watch a lot of tv i don't watch like all of the prestige stuff but i've i know what i've seen some of the awards bait and i'm like by no measure by no measure is our flag means death inferior there is no bar that they don't clear the t especially the first season um that got just so underappreciated and just so unpromoted by as you're saying as we're saying max like it's not a matter of uh, a lack of energy from either the fans or anyone who worked on it but as we work in publishing and you in media, you know that it's that industry that is really what determines uh, how big that bridge gets to be between the creators and the creatives and the viewers. And they just decided not to strengthen that bridge. And then they treated us like we were annoying them for saying like, but we're here to build your bridge so strong. It's just like by no measure, like, you know, acting, writing, directing, they did so much. They accomplished such a powerful tone, a consistent imagery, like the potential potential to be an awards darling was right there if they just uh were allowed to be taken seriously but they were not presented um as serious awards consideration for I think a variety of reasons that are not there yeah and it really a lot of like decisions in publishing and decisions in the entertainment and in any entertainment business kind of comes down to like one random person who's a gatekeeper who's like eh and another yeah. person who's like, yeah, and it's like, and even this ties into the to the Looney Tunes um, Acme versus mm. Coyote thing, uh, whereas you really like one guy is just David Zaslav is just like, eh, we're gonna delete this, e even though it's you know the audiences are loving it, it's doing really successful, and it's weird because it's like, do you not want to make money, but the tax write off? and not it's pay. so dystopian i mean it's so dystopian it's so sad dystopian. It's so and of course it's happening like i mean i of course i'm i'm very upset about it across the board like justice for willow which was a great show mm -hmm. it was extremely mm -hmm. gay it was super campy so fun and it got taken a out league of, of their Disney own Plus. yeah so a many. league of their own yeah. yeah there's so much that's like just getting removed from the canon because somebody doesn't want to pay to to host it but they're also not making it available to purchase as like a download or a dvd or anything like that mm -hmm. and so we're losing this incredible canon of content that isn't going to get to exist in a place where we can consume it anymore because somebody somewhere decided that it wasn't worthwhile to them well most mostly that they don't want to pay the the residuals in the union contract yes that's <sighs> what it's about yeah. and we it, would pay so much for an our flag dvd like right my oh god, god just like throw in some of the we john wednesday recording some behind the scenes some bloopers we would i would pay so much money for season one and season two on dvd i swear we yeah. could fund season three ourselves whatever the gap is we would pay it in like dvds and official merch if they just yeah. let us <laughs> but yeah. I think from, and I'm not super clear about like timeline, but I think Our Flag Means Death was greenlighted prior to Zaslav coming in. So when uh. Zaslav comes in, like his, his focus is just, you know, business bro, maximum money mm -hmm. in the shortest amount of time kind of like focus. So this would have been kind of one of those like slow money deals of like three seasons with like residuals coming in for the people over time. And like, like none of that was the priority when Zaslav came in. He, he's just yeah. about the quick money, quick turnaround, like fuck original content. I want to go right for like the low labor cost of reality TV shows. It didn't have have sucks. much of a chance after Zaslav got in got in yeah. what I'm hearing is is that allowing for capitalism to dictate what art gets created is bad yes yep. I feel like yep. that's a great assessment <laughs> yeah let's introduce you guys <laughs> we no let's have... all be nameless voices <laughs> we'll just be nameless <laughs> yeah <laughs> we we have an awesome group of co-hosts today talking about Jim. This is the Jim episode. We have YA author of Tarnished Are the Stars, Fire Becomes Her, Life is Strange, Steph's Story, and The Meaning of Pride. Rosie Thor is back on the pod. Yeah. Yay. Rosie.
Lizzie <laughs> is doing what we all aspire to do. And you are going to be writing some traditionally published fanfic. You're going to be I know. paid it's to write special fan fiction. fiction. Um, I, I will say that I have I have already been paid to write fan fiction uh, for Life is Strange, the video game series. Oh, that's true. And that's I will true. say that um, while I was writing that book, I was also simultaneously writing an equal amount of Our Flag Means Death fan fiction. Love so it. I would spend my day, like my day job was writing fan fiction for money for a company that had hired me to write a book for their series. And then as soon as five o'clock hit, I would switch Word documents and just like absolutely just go ham on some some Our Flag Means Death fan fiction. And it was great. Okay. There was like a month where I wrote like an equal amount of both. And it was the best I have ever felt creatively. <laughs> You're living the dream. I mean, maybe, who knows, maybe we're going to have Our Flag novels out there someday. Uh, and there's certainly a plethora of fanfic authors who would be up for the task. Neva Jenkins, call me. <laughs> <laughs> also on the pod is Maya Gittleman. Maya has a story in the Night of the Living Queers anthology out now from Wednesday Books. They are a writer and critic at Reactor and Tor.com and wrote the iconic essay, Act of Grace, Masculinity, Monstrosity, and Queer Catharsis in Our Flag Means Death, published April 25th. 2022. And it's an amazing essay. I have uh, my favorite part. You write, the entire story is one of deliberate compassion. It's the very fabric of the show, from Lucius supporting Steed and Ed through their rougher patches to his healthy, we don't own each other relationship with Black Pete. Olu taking every opportunity to be thoughtful and gentle with Jim, his offering of, if you want, we could be family. That's the core of it. It, the very queer structure of chosen family. Steed couldn't be himself in a cishet family. He made room for the honest emotions aboard the Revenge, and it didn't take long for the rest of the crew to find belonging on that ship. Their dynamic is tender and legibly queer, a challenge to the machismo and toxic masculinity of the rest of the pirate culture, as well as an open critique of cishet white colonizer masculinity. Not only does the entire structure of the Revenge exemplify Amplify masculinities that make no space for toxic cruelty, including trans, gender nonconforming, body diverse masculinity. It renders the sort of behavior absurd and out of place. This show emphasizes that while Steed's efforts are clumsy, the environment of kindness and support he creates is effectual because it feels so much better than the self punishment most pirates swear by. <laughs> It's oh, love, love all of that. Thank you. Thank um, you. I stand by it. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> you end your essay with this brilliant line in the clearest, most subversive sense. The story is an act of grace. So what's your story of how you found the show, Maya, and came to watch it for the first time? Wow. Um, I was chatting with some other friends during the lockdown about other shows that I tried to fill my brain with so that it wasn't full of just like, you know, fascism and then 18 raging apocalypses that were going on at the time. A couple of my friends were like, uh, like, while it was airing, oh, this is really good. This is really fun. And I was like, I like Taika like this. Maybe this sounds interesting. Um, but it was not until they were maybe about I think they'd seen the kiss. Like, I think the friend who was recommending it to me had already seen episode not but at least episode seven. And they were like, no, this is going there. I think this is going this is happening. Um, you're going to want to watch this and I was like all right like I guess you know I, I need something to fill my brain like I can be queer baited I've been queer baited before and I really thought that was what was going to happen until I was a few episodes in and then my friend definitely saw the kiss and was like don't worry it's going to be happening and then yeah yes they it was very exciting um and then when I saw that I mean it was really a process of when I began the show I was like oh I see they're going to have side characters have queer storylines because they will refuse to let the central storyline be what it is and I was so sure I was so sure. I was like all right fine whatever <laughs> isn't that so like, funny that we do cute. that though? I'm really into Jim Lucia all right this is cute okay I could just I feel my brain chemistry um changing 
when I was just watching those last few episodes and just everything clicking into place was so tremendous. And uh, I have not stopped thinking about it since. Uh, Rosie and I were definitely... While you were writing uh, professional fanfic and then unprofessional fanfic, I was there in the mornings being like, I know you just got to get to later in the day when we can write what we actually want to write. Um, it was a it was a wild and chaotic time. And so it also meant that I was I finished the show uh, or season one um, right around when it ended. So I was there for the length of the God will they renew it the first time. Um, what a time. <sighs> yeah. Gosh, and now. Gosh. What a time. I think it's so funny that we do that to ourselves as a community, though. We'll watch a show and like some we will all have convinced ourselves that we're being queer baited because we've it's happened so many times, even when our friends who are also queer, who are also like media literate. It's it's not like these are people who've like never seen a show before are being like, no, it's going to it's going to be there. It's going to get there. We still don't believe it, even if they've seen something that they know for sure it went there. We still don't believe them when they say it because we've been queer baited so many times where we get like a little hint of something and we think like, oh, maybe it's maybe it's hinting at it. Maybe it's hinting at it. Like even when the foot touch happened, I was like, I still don't know if we're going there. <laughs> and so I I really do think that it's like this weird phenomenon of like, we just don't believe that we will be given a happily, like a happy ever after, or like we, we will not be given like queer joy on the screen because it is so often ripped away from us yeah. right at the last second. We're it's so used to being abused. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. It's it's like a PTSD just, child recovering from trauma when someone tells you the I love minimal you. amount of like, effort it would take to make us happy is wild. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's still very healing. <laughs> um, I mean, so Maya, how did you uh, come to being inspired to write that and then writing that wonderful essay? I can't like I think I I don't know how to not have like an essay in me after it, something like that. Um, it's just how I process stuff. Uh, it's part of why I love working with Reactor and the team there. They, I think like, I actually, my first email was like, because this is right when it had just come, like it was the end of April, maybe early March, 2022. And I'd only ever covered shows that were like very obviously genre fiction. So I was like, does this count? Like, is this, is this genre enough for, for like, is now Reactor will in, like incorporates other genre media. But at the time was so focused on sci-fi fantasy that I was like, can I even talk about this? Like, and I was already coming up with, I was like, oh, I have so much to say about masculinity and monstrosity. And so by the time they were like, yeah, you have the green light um i had so I, I mean like the the actual essay itself is very very long um and it's also like a fraction of what it initially started out as um i was so blown away by the and this is this is in the essay i'm sure i'll say it better in the essay than than now but i was so blown away by the fact that uh it had such a cohesive uh like so many cohesive arcs that intersected so well um and so much co like consistent symbology with the like with the purple with the red silk with um the petrified orange like there's just this language of like we could be family and wounds and the lighthouse that like not only do i love in general but i also am used to like a like like i'm used to pulling like queer content out of subtext I'm used to looking at symbols and being like, wow, like that could mean this. Like, let's close read mm -hmm. that. Like, wouldn't it be great if that meant this? And so to be provided with a text where queerness was both the text and the subtext and the background story and the plot and the character arcs, but also that was so rich with these little moments of connection, like between actors, but then also within the set and the directing choices and stuff like that. It was so rich. It felt like I wanted it to get celebrated. Basically, I, I was thinking of that essay at first also as my love letter to the show. Yeah. I still do yeah, um, in beautiful. a lot of ways. Thank you. Maya also writes some really like other, just like, really great essays on other media. And I feel like the fandom here that, that the listeners to this podcast yeah, yeah. Uh, very much appreciate Maya's take on Good Omens. Um, if you Ooh. Google it, yeah. uh, it's Smited, Smote, Smitten, a reading on queer longing in Good Omens. And it's a great essay and everyone should check it out. Thank oh, you. Uh, and then just read everything that Maya has written for Reactor. <laughs> Thank you. You're the best. <laughs> oh, look up, okay, Maya Gittleman, reactor.com. Everyone do a Google search right now. Start reading some stuff. Thank you. If you do oh. like the good, the, the Our Flag essay, I do, you might enjoy my takes on Good Omens as well. Good Omens season two. Yeah, I just, I love 
the rich tapestry of like, the, there was just so much to talk about and I wanted it to get celebrated. And it definitely is now, but especially like towards the beginning, I'm like, I want wherever I have access, wherever I have like a professional voice, I want to use that to talk about the queer stories that are being told, especially uh, with queer people of color, um, especially in genre spaces. And just especially when a story is not afraid to, to not pull punches um, and to let them land as hard as they can, like I think they did with a lot of the show and a lot of Jim, then I want to shout that from the rooftops because I want it known because that's what pushes boundaries. And that's what gives permission for more diverse array of queer storytelling and QTPOC storytelling is to see what's actually out there and to see what's connecting with people. And the show does such a beautiful job of that. And I had to shout it out as best as I could. We're so glad you did. Also joining us on the show is Tragically Nerdy on AO3. We're going to call you Nerdy. Nerdy writes a lot of gym fix and curates a wonderful list on Tumblr of gym fix. Yeah. Tell us, <laughs> how did you find the show? So I, kind of same to other people through other queer friends, uh, specifically, I have some really lovely, very close friends who I was in a previous fandom with, uh, which was like a cowboy fandom. So I jumped from cowboys to pirates. Nice. Um, which show? It, so it's a, a critical role miniseries called Undeadwood. It's I, like a very I small thought it might be. <laughs> four part TTRPG. Um, that was my fandom beforehand. And it's it's a very small fandom. It kind of died because no no new content was created. Um, but some friends when our flag came out were like, hey, you would like this. It's really queer. It's, you know, there's pirates. Um, and at the time, like, so something that I talk about sometimes is that I have an acquired brain injury and I wasn't watching a lot of TV because um, it was too much for my brain. I very specifically, I remember watching it, an episode and being like, fuck, I can't watch another episode today, but I'm going to watch one tomorrow and just like binged it as quickly as I could binge TV. Mm -hmm. And I also... At the time, I was doing my own, like, coming out as non-binary process. And so it was a very fun, uh, it was a really good show for me at the time. Because it, you know, I think it was my first non-binary character that I'd seen on TV in Jim. And I latch on to characters very quickly. And just very quickly, it was like, Jim, this is, you know, this is my new focus for the next oh. little while. And at the time, I was, I was very determined that I was not going to write fan fiction for our flag I was like I'm I have a fandom this is fine and then now I have like 30 fix I feel like everyone I know had that experience of like I'm not gonna need to write fan fiction about this and then like smash cut <laughs> yeah. to the like furious typing at the computer <laughs> that you're just like walking down the street and you're like oh no it came to me another story <laughs> that was literally <laughs> me with my first fic I was coming back from a book uh festival and I was like it's fine I don't need to write fan fiction about this my emotions will just go away and then I was like walking around San Francisco with my friends trying to do things and just like staring into the distance being like but what if yeah. what if they had a plant <laughs> like you know just like just stupid stuff like that and it's like it just comes to you and you have to it's like there's nothing you can do with your life until you write it down and then you can move on yeah. you're an <laughs> instrument of divinity you're yeah exactly of, yeah you know the I get it now sense. I get how the prophets like I get yeah. it they, they were probably like struck like that they were writing Bible fan fiction. We were writing Our Flag Means Death fan fiction. It all checks out. Tony is also on the show. Tony is a jewelry maker at Blue Box Imaginarium who made my Woken Gay pendant. I'm very grateful for. And Tony is also a fan. And you go to, you work with talent, right? You, you're involved in cons and events and things like that. So you um, would, will be able to give us good advice about what can fans do to be respectful fans when approaching, communicating with our idols, the people that we love, either on the internet or in person on cons? Well, one of the things that I frequently end up telling people as they're standing in line waiting and hyperventilating is to remember that they're just people. And if you would not go up to a complete stranger and trauma dump on them, or talk about all kinds of very personal issues. We all want to share how much these people mean to us, right? And perhaps get into the depths of the emotional side of things that they have helped us with. But they are just human and they are dealing with 
hundreds and potentially thousands of people, especially at conventions. That's where I normally am working. And that's tough. Like you wouldn't you wouldn't want to drop that on even necessarily your best friend without asking first. Be mindful of how they are feeling. Be mindful of the fact that they have a really long line of people who want to talk to them. Everyone obviously wants to have the perfect moment and as staff at a convention i want you to have that perfect moment and to be able to connect in some way but so do the hundred other people in line so basically just like be aware of what's around you know be aware hey they've got a long line everyone is here everyone wants to meet con of course everyone wants to meet con but the convention is supposed to close at seven o'clock and when we're still signing autographs at 8 p.m so keep it keep it short and maybe keep it focus on the positive focus on because yes. as a creative person myself i love hearing that my work means something to someone look at yes look at the positive side look at what that does for you rather than going to like oh my God, I had such bad depression. I had this, I had that. Like, don't focus on yourself, mm -hmm. keep it on them. So focus on saying something that will make them feel really good. Yes. I, I, I will I also, I just want to say, because I spent years as an event manager at the Barnes & Noble um, at Upper West Side, which is how I got to meet a lot of folks. Not Rosie though, you were, you're on the other coast. I did some events with like some large authors, some authors with big lines. Your excitement is natural. It's not going to take away from the spontaneity of the moment to prepare a little bit, um, especially while you're in line. Like I understand wanting it to be like, oh, I just don't know what I'm going to say once I get there. You know, there's, I'm not saying overthink because that can also be a big thing. Also, don't put that much pressure on the interaction. It's a long line. Sometimes it's a lot of money. And sometimes like you just build it up in your head. And then sometimes like depending on the line or the event, it's over in minutes or seconds. Instead, like I think like preparing in the line and asking yourself, what, what do you want to say to them? What do you want out of this experience? And what are you asking from them? So I think it's okay to say, hey, this came to me in a really hard time, but then end on gratitude and on. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Your performance, you know, um, or I, you know, I had this hard thing happened to me and this gave me so much hope through it. Thank you. You know, like be cognizant of what you're asking from them because they're not going to make you feel better about your trauma inherently. That's not their job. It's not their job. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of them do it and that's very wonderful and gracious of them, but it isn't their job. And I think just like having some preparation of like, all right, I'm going to talk to this actor. I want them to know this about that. Or then if you're going to see another actor later on, have another thought of like, this is what I want to share with this person. And so don't put too much pressure on what you get from it or what you want to say in that moment, because then you might just be unsatisfied with what ends up happening. But I think it can help to prepare a little bit and think, I want to tell them this so that when you get up there, you're not saying, oh, I have so much I want to tell you. I can't even, I don't know where to start. Um, and then also, yeah, I think it's it's okay, I think, to share some of that trauma in a in a in a way that is emotionally respectful. Um, but also, yeah, just like think about where you're la leaving them. Leaving on a positive doesn't need to be like something saccharine or that you don't feel is authentic necessarily. Not that you were I'm just saying I'm just saying like you can leave it in a place where wow, this came to me in a really hard time and thank you. And I like I'm so excited for whatever you do next, you know, like and you don't need to leave it on something inherently sad or negative. And I think, yeah, just preparing a little bit, even if you don't think you need to. Beautiful. Well said. And you also try to be present, like stay in it. the moment. That's, mm -hmm. You that's know, it. don't don't be like, oh my God, this is gonna be the best thing ever. I'm so excited. This is gonna like be so wonderful, and then completely blank out and not be able to actually experience the moment. And part of being present is also, I think, just reading their body language. Like, don't police it. But like, if any person is flinching away from a hug or a selfie or looks really tired, you know, like you would uh, anyone else, believe them, lean away. Don't don't take it personally yourself because it's not you. It's the line. So just like this is a job for them. I think it's sometimes we forget that because we get so caught up in how important this thing was to us. But it's like at the end of the day, this is their work. And to not, you know, you wouldn't necessarily put that on somebody who's, you know, making your coffee. So just be respectful of the fact that this is their work and this is a job and they're getting paid for this. So. I will also add that um, 
in in contrast to that, I think it is it is a job to them, and we do want to be respectful of their time. But also, it is it is always a nice thing to do to shout someone out and say like I loved their performance in this like in an online space and tag them. It is it is never a problem to say something nice about someone's performance or say something nice about something that someone created in a public forum and and let them know that you're happy about that. They may not see it, they may not like the post and that's okay, but um I think that a lot of people, at least I hear this a lot, people say like they think that authors will like find it annoying if an if a reader like emails us to say that they really liked our book. It is never annoying. I have gotten some of the nicest messages from people out of the blue randomly in my inbox and it happens less often than you would think to a lot of creators. Um mm -hmm. you know, probably the stars are getting a lot of love, but a lot of the secondary actors or um the crew may not be seeing that same that same love. And so it's really, it is okay to share that enjoyment and that love online in spaces where they might see or or make it possible for them to see it by tagging them. I think that's like a very positive thing to do. It becomes, I think, perhaps toxic if you are expecting a response and don't get one. They need to set boundaries about their interactions with us as well. They need to be able to set boundaries around their work and what they are and are not willing to engage with. So if they don't respond, it doesn't necessarily mean they didn't like that you said it or that they didn't you know, see it. It might just be that they're trying not to be too online or they're trying not to respond to anything today. Things like that. Um, so I, I I also think that in online spaces, there are slightly different rules for engagement, basically. And a good rule to follow is basically just take your cues from them. They are the person who is, you know, kind of more famous and probably being interacted with a lot. And uh, I can't remember who said it. Somebody mentioned the idea of essentially matching, like, the amount of effort that you are putting in. Oh, that was me. Responses. Was yeah. that you, Carly? Yeah. So I said, like, yeah. if, if if you if you send someone a sentence and they reply back with a sentence, uh, you know, that's like matching. Uh, but if you if someone replies back to you with a sentence and then you reply with a paragraph, that can be kind of overwhelming for them. A lot of us who are in those positions have then had to deal with online harassment or online stalking. <laughs> And you don't ever want to be putting someone in a position where they're worried about that. So yeah. if you can match the amount of effort that they are putting into their interaction with you, um, that's going to be probably the best way forward yeah. to kind of show that you respect their time, but also still engage with them. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. And I, you guys, we started this conversation. I didn't get a chance to inter introduce Carly Delso Saavedra, who is here to uh, reporting live from San Diego right after the vote thing. Um, Carly, what, what are you looking forward to this week? Because you have a lot of things planned. Mm, yeah. So uh, today was definitely something I've been looking forward to in terms of planning boots on the ground kind of uh, visual response to uh, the cancellation of our show and trying to get people together so that they can start meeting each other and kind of building up uh, the communities and the coalitions kind of on the ground um, for this. So Tuesday is an extension of that and that's going to be up in Burbank and it's going to be really fun. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Really looking forward to it. Thank you for being such a great part of the fandom, getting everyone organized and all involved. It's so fantastic what you do. And I'm the other Carly. I'm Northern Hemisphere Carly, Carly Heath, uh, Yavid Jenkins on AO3. And uh, I write books too. You can find my book, The Reckless Kind, every new where books are sold. We are talking about Jim this week, everyone's favorite non-binary polyamorous pirate. We love Jim. They are the one member of the crew, other than Ed and Steed, who's got like a really fleshed out backstory. What do you guys think about Jim's backstory? Do you have anything more that you would like to see in Jim's backstory? I think something that I would like to see that I, I see pop up a lot in the fandom is like, what happened to their brother? If they're like, particularly, we know they had a brother. It's not really clear if he died when their father was killed. Um, and so kind of like, is he still alive out there? Is he something that might come back in at some point in time in their story? Uh, there's a lot of really good fanfic where that kind of like works Jim's brother in. Um, but that's something that I'm always like, Ooh, I'd love to know more about this period where they don't remember and like kind of what happened in that. I just yep. love Nana. I love, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Coming for some cake. Yeah. Like, let's go. <laughs> 
Um, the nun I, who teaches knife throwing. I love mm-hmm. I love a, a nun who teaches knife throwing. I think it's such a great vibe. And it's such a complex relationship, right? Like it's such an interesting relationship with Jim that we see just in tidbits in one episode. And also picks up on the pronouns and immediately. Immediately. Yeah. This is not the problem. The problem is the you're not following it. You're God driven. Nana's the best. Like, it, like I, I just rewatched that scene a little while ago to prepare for this, and also because I watch it for joy whenever I want. Um, and I, I mean, just the yeah, come in for some cake. The like, what are they like? Christ's oranges. After she like, she introduces herself with like, oh, excuse me, you think Jim? Where do you think Jim learned how to throw a knife? You know, like, oh my God, she is just one of the coolest characters. With like, she really sets the tone. She also sets the tone for this other sort of parental figure, where we know we've got a lot of bad dads on the show. Um, and she's like, she's she's such a good parental figure this nana um in how much she obviously loves jim jim feels safe there in a lot of ways there's this comfort um but at the same time this nun raised jim to be a killing machine uh to event what is it uh avenge the family honor to be the wrath of avenge avenge the bloodline (laughs) like yeah exactly and that is such a fantastic fascinating detail like I don't know. It feels very like, uh, I don't know. You can see where Jim gets it from a little bit. Um, I would have loved, I don't know. It's just such a really rich, there's a lot of rich potential in how uh, parallels between how Jim was raised versus how some of our other leads were that we know were raised like Steed and Ed. Um, and I just love the idea of this like, tough as nails mother figure um who you know is the surrogate after this like horrific murder uh and who is raising jim to be well like assigned knives at birth like you know like this killing machine which is in so many ways like not a gentle upbringing and at the same time like uh, allowing them much more freedom and power than they would have had otherwise in some cases Mm -hmm. and like than steeter ed had uh, and that is just so fascinating and fruitful. And I I love it. And I wish it gotten explored more. But yeah, just that parallel of parental figure. Nana is just kicks ass. What do we love about Jim? What drew you to Jim as a character? Not a fucking mermaid. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, it was the, um, the moment where they had everybody on the ship. And um, they were, just, it was kind of like all of the, characters of color standing on the outside of the table and all of the like our gay pirates but also the colonizers on the inside sitting down there was like racism starting to come out (laughs) and i didn't know anything about this show and there was just like this twist in my gut of like fuck here we go again not only the microaggressions but also like the overt racism kicking into a show and then um having jim kind of just do that little nod of their head and then like the whipping of the of the knife right through the hand like that was like that was the moment where i was like this is my favorite show that's a good moment Ah, so good speaking of they went there um i'm gonna shout out one of my very favorite gym moments which yes. is when they kiss lucius and i think it's season one episode three mm-hmm. and it's that freaking beautiful moment of like lucius has just been like i've got your dagger and jim seizes him by the lapels um and goes now oh, this is a david jenkins thing i, just I was gonna say <laughs> David James yeah, really loves so right. us seizing people seizing by the lapels, lapels, and I think that we should, to honor that, all write fan fiction specifically about that trope. I think that the entire yes. fandom should just write a lot of lapel seizing. That was the moment where I was like, you know, that now this is a good friend, and then looks at Olu like mm-hmm. a cat, you know, like in this very mm-hmm. like coy, flirty way, and like the way that they've just been like throwing Lucius around. Like I, I think that I'm getting my timeline right. That has yeah. Lucius already been mm-hmm. in the in the trunk. trunk at that point, right? Yeah. Like mm-hmm. and and like now it's like, but I saved your dagger, and like because like Lucius clearly knows how to survive amongst pirates on a pirate ship all this and then this moment this is when i was like wow they are going there like this is jim immediately like polyamorous queer chaos like i was like this show is so queer not just in terms of like steed and ed's like own character arcs or their relationship dynamics or even just the queer relationships that end up being couples 
um, or throuples and so forth in later seasons. But it's queer just in terms of these dynamics, like in terms of like, mwah, like, like a queer <laughs> friend group of like, pi- of course they're gonna kiss each other on the mouths, you know, at these moments. And J- and Lucius, Lucius saying like, would it be totally weird if I was just suddenly into Jim? When I was like, wow, that line lands not because Lucius is gay and yeah, that's right, the timeline, not because Lucius is gay and has just learned that Jim is not a cis man, but it lands because it's like, I can't, would it be weird if I was into Jim because they just like tried to kill me a bunch, yeah, yeah. you know, and like stuffed me in a trunk and I thought I was going to die. And I, that is to me what really set up the tone of the show. We've been talking in the past about characters who are the least cringe on the show. And I, mm. I kind of feel like Jim falls into the possibly the least cringe mm. of all the cast. I mean, I think it's mm. pretty clear that Jim is like the coolest. <laughs> Yeah. Like in all situations, even when things are really bad for Jim, they're still like incredibly fucking cool. This is true. Which just now that you're saying that, now that I'm just thinking about this, would we love to see of Jim becoming what uncool? Like but one the one thing that just like is in my mind right now, like as a fanfic idea that I'm throwing out there for the world is what would happen if Jim was not suddenly lost the ability to do the knife thing? Like making me think of Mozart in the Jungle, if you've ever seen that, there's an episode or or a storyline where the maestro loses his ability to hear. And I'm like, I would love to see Jim lose the ability for some reason to throw the knives. Maybe their balance is off, maybe something, something. And then they they deal with that in a really cringe way. With Look, the- I think we all know how they're going to lose the ability to throw knives. And it's obviously bondage. <laughs> Oh, this is amazing. Okay, tell us more. Extremely funny that I'm the one to say this. Yeah, tell us more, Rosie. (laughs) I know where I was going with that, but pitch this idea. (laughs) Pitch this idea. I don't. I don't think I have to pitch it any further. Okay, they lose. Hands are tied behind their back or to a to a headboard, like it it, it writes itself. Okay, I was thinking more of a long term thing where, like, okay, so maybe they they had their wrists tied, and then at some point they strain, they get like. uh, what's the thing? Tennis elbow for from bondage, yeah, and, right? Jim yeah. gets carpal tunnel. There's an episode. Jim could that. easily get so carpal tunnel just, just from from fucking Jim. Yeah. You know, Jim 100%. could absolutely like after a week with Archie be like, yeah. okay, you know what? This is actually like a oh my god. This my is wrist so is no longer up to its hearing. normal action, huh? All right. Like, I could absolutely see that happening. I was thinking, when you said, like, incapacitated, I was thinking, first of all, like, the torture scene. <laughs> like, my mental, like, my, I'm like, oh, that would have just been so easy, so good. Have Jim, uh, like, have them, like, have their hands or wrists in the little torture uh, clamp or whatever that was. Um, and then have them be, in, at least in some ways, in. Uh, incapable of using their hands for days, weeks, at least one battle after that event and have Izzy help train them how to fight in other ways because Izzy knows what it is to learn how to fight without like use of a limb that you thought you'd always have. That could be amazing. Also because I Mm. love the two of them together. So that's where my mind first went, but then it went also immediately into just like, well, when Jim is actually getting to fuck someone with a vagina, I think it's completely plausible that in fact their wrists would be incapacitated in no time at all, especially knowing what we know of Archie. Yeah. I think they could, uh, um, you know. I love this so the much. I think, Jim's yeah, tunnel. Tunnel. I think there's several <laughs> things in that. And I think some good Samaritan should write them for us. But but what I'm, I'm going to keep on going down this path. What, yes. I, what I'm going <laughs> for um, is I do want Jim to hit, hit that rock bottom moment in the way that Ed did with the cake toppers. Um, where I mean, with at, Archie, I think at, they'll hit rock bottom. <laughs> All right, the joke was right there. It was hanging fruit <laughs> for a bit. <laughs> I, I have to say then my, my other big Jim thought is along these lines, because I also wanted them to break down uh, a lot and... Rosie has heard me vent about this before, uh, but I have this vision, especially after season one. Well, I guess after season one, um, in which, look, it would have made so much sense to me. Wow. Okay. Wait, I have multiple visions. Let me find the most appropriate one. Okay. Yes. It would make so much. And then Rosie knows the range. I literally know exactly what you're going to say. (laughs) Yeah. All right. This, this one. Um, Okay. I think 
that I could so easily have seen Jim confront, like Jim, when they still, when they were realizing, okay, this is what's happening. Olu it, and the rest of the crew are on that island. They've been left to die. I've been, you know, like I've been, God, what is the word? Like conscripted into other ships before, but like not without, I'm not doing this without him. Um, and I could just so easily see Jim being the one to say, hey, just because it got fucked up for you, just because a pretty boy broke your heart does not mean you have the right to throw that out for the rest of us. Revenge isn't going to save you. Ask me how I know. Mm. Mm. I killed one of the Siete Gallos. I, you know, hunted, I went to Leslie Jones. I went, you know, like I'm on my own journey of revenge. And you know what? None of that helped. The only thing that helps is him. And you're going to do whatever it takes to get me back to him. Then a knife fight. Because I believe that Jim... The Menace Jimenez is the only person who could take the Kraken in his peak grief mode in mm. a knife fight and live. And mm. I would love to see it. It would have been the coolest, flashiest knife work. I think Ed would have like thrown away his guns just for the heck of the fun of it. Like, wow, like I'm actually feeling like finally someone is a, a challenge for me. You know, like when was the last time he actually fought someone who could fight him back i think jim would actually give him enough of a run for his money that they would stay alive long enough to convince him we have to go back for them. i'm a little salty I'm, that we didn't get to see them fight each other they should have fought it was right there yeah jim with nothing to lose jim yeah. who yeah. has just like found peace in olu and like knows that that's what they want over revenge mm. jim who yeah. knows better than anyone that revenge is not going to make your like is not going to bring back your loved ones like yeah. there was so much potential for that particular mm. mm -hmm. uh for that to for that to have been discussed between jim and ed and that moment when jim drops he was your friend like yeah. i'm like you mm -hmm. see i believe it i believe that jim could have held their own against ed uh, yeah, and I, I would have Just loved to see that fight. I will of, say, the, because oh, this is like a fanfic podcast, there are some really good fanfics that have like basically that scene. I have uh, like a list that I curated about a year ago um, and that I'm planning to add to. But some of the ones, uh, like there's one, uh, there are two that come to mind with that in it. But there is uh, one that I think has a, a couple scenes kind of similar to that where it, there's like Jim and Ed talking and fighting and it's great uh that is called suck the rot right out of my bloodstream by never shoot a mockingbird and it's focused on jim frenchy and lucius kind of on the kraken ship and then ends when mm. Olu arrives and like very sad lots of jim being a disaster it's it's beautiful Ooh, um, i, I want to hear more about this jim being a disaster disaster in what way in, in vicious way or in sad i think in a sad way i yes I this is what i want I read that one but like there are a lot of i'm i'm such a fan of like sad jim i have uh, mm. a fic that is not out but that's a, a, a an 150k like work in progress with a friend that's basically this is a total tangent but is also like uh, uh, Jim and Ed become each other's terrible rebounds, and it's yes! like yes. really sad. Uh, Jim and Ed, and then finding like life and hope through it. But coming mm. away from that, <laughs> not self referencing this one that really stands out for that scene in particular, the like Jim Ed fighting and Jim calling it out on his bullshit. Is some say it's a blessing by Elianoids on Ao3. I'm not sure how to pronounce their their username, but it, there's like it's a Jim Olu are soulmates who feel each other's pain, uh, fic, and there's a really beautiful like scene where Jim, you know, standing over Ed's bed with a knife, and then Ed wakes up, and there's a knife fight, and then they're like, you know, we don't. Um, they changed us, and so we can't ever go back because mm -hmm. the love that we had with this person forever changed our lives um, and forever changed us. And we were stuck with that and we have to go forward. Um, it's really lovely, but that's, that's the fic that I like to say made me like lay down on my couch, like a fainting lady from the 1800s. There's like a beautiful. I love that. I love Speaking that. of Ed and Jim as like a dynamic duo, um, this is kind of taking us in a different direction, but one of my big like things that I wish that we had gotten to see or like would like to see some fan fiction of, or maybe we'll write some fan fiction for myself of, um, is uh, especially once we got the like teaser trailer for season two and we knew that there was like the little wedding cake toppers. Yeah. 
and that like Ed was like maybe daydreaming about a wedding moment. Um, I really would have liked to see or you know read some fan fiction of Jim, and we know that Vico has this skill, so that's you know something that they could do. Um, Jim teaching Ed to dance. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I'd love to see them fight, but then also it would be really, really great to see them like do a little tango. Oh, I love that. <laughs> yes, yes. And is oh gosh, so many thoughts like blooming from that idea. Mm-hmm. Is Ed awkward at first, or it does Ed have? some skill does Ed like throw his pelvis and his limbs and his I think Jim leads I think no one's no one's done that before no one was ever like you'd think that Blackbeard would kill you if you tried and I think that that he really likes that because he definitely Mm -hmm. does like I have I have a lot of like you know gentle beard dancing head cannons but like the thought of it being Jim is so beautiful and I love that mm-hmm. being like Ed's introduction to letting someone else lead. What would we like to see uh Jim do in season 3 specifically? Polycure. Or poly content. Yes. Oh, yes. Actually yeah. kiss Oluwande. And yes. I, I guess there was a live that Vico did today that I missed sadly. Uh yeah, but I saw someone a tweet about it. Yeah. Live tweeted a, some a lot of the content and uh Vico was saying there was a lot of polycule content that they shot i've heard that too and i'm sad that it got cut i think the that's least, a real shame. The deleted scenes yeah, yeah. <laughs> give us i love content. that they did it i definitely want more of that um in re-watching some of their earlier scenes i want them to plant a tree i mm-hmm. want them you know the whole mm-hmm. sense of uh they don't want to go back to saint augustine that's where you know and then they find my family's tree and then that orange was technically theirs, you know, or what, whatever. And then uh, and Steve takes it. So I love the sense of them planting a tree somewhere new, growing roots that aren't on their family's land. Like, I, you know, I want I like the idea of them wandering and adventuring and collecting partners here and there for a while. But I also love the idea of them making a home base somewhere. And maybe maybe it is on St. Augustine because they've definitely reframed that narrative in some ways. Like, may, but maybe it's somewhere completely new. Maybe it's somewhere that they find with Zhang and Olu and Archie and I just I love I love plant symbolism also and like I feel like they let go of it a little bit in season two but like the beautiful mm. you know Steed's mm-hmm. plant it's there I think like you know that's that that was such a big part of Jim's story in season one the sense of like this was my family's land these are the trees that grow here all the fruit is dried up now anyway um so the sense of him like I, I mean I really like the idea of like the cat like not the cast well the crew like all of the pirates planting something together specifically for them that would be such a beautiful and fitting season three uh experience and a way of also like symbolizing a polycule you can see the many roots in a tree you can grow something that is like very obviously symbolic of a polyamorous situation um and also just like the beautiful non-binary uh like existence that jim leads like their their life like i feel like you could i want them to plant something in that vein of them potentially returning to saint augustine I really, really like the idea of uh, a like you know a more established polycule returning to Saint Augustine <gasps> and Nana and Auntie meeting. Yes, oh, <laughs> Nana yes. and Auntie oh. story, and like consider they open they open a restaurant for soup and cake, <laughs> soup and cake, <laughs> soup and cake shop, shop mm-hmm. soup and cake, soup and Look, cake. There's a lot of there's a lot of possibilities there. I feel like I just like I'm, a my mind is shop, gone. flower shop it. AU just waiting to happen. Yeah, I know. It's like, mind. let's go. <laughs> I want to jump back to that tree planting idea of yeah. with with the polycule being like, I mean, if we plant a tree, we can graft different things onto it. Oh, that's <sighs> cool. So we have all of the different things coming together into one tree mm. and all having different kinds of fruit and just like it's everyone all mixed up into one thing. Oh, I, like I want that, that idea. For the whole ship. I love yeah. that. I mean, we could just like everyone comes in and graft something new on, and we'll see where it takes us and what what, what weird new fruit we'll get out of it. Mm-hmm. My yes. mind keeps going to I for season three. We would need some sort of conflict, and we didn't. We don't want the conflict to be within the polycule. Um, I feel like what no. if 
there was a situation where Jim got abducted, needed rescuing, needed something, and the rest of the polycule had to come together to rescue Jim. Extremely they had to work on it to be Jim too, because like the three of them, Jim is kind of who I feel like who they have in common in a big way. Yeah. And so if it's Jim, especially because Jim is like so competent at the knife throwing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess I guess less for for Zhang. Um, like Olu is really the like common thread there, but still, I think there's like I feel like Olu is too easy to get like abducted too. Like I feel like uh, he's like this, you know, canonically the soft one and tender. Yeah. And I feel like it would it would be nice to see. I'm also just like, yeah, I want to see Jim get put in a terrible situation. That sounds great. Um, <laughs> I would love to see the polycule work together to rescue Jim and yeah. Jim just like. By the time they get there, like Jim has already like taken down the enemies, is, like <laughs> on the trying on the clothes, you know, whatever. Like, but like they had to do whatever shenanigans to get there and like to get mm-hmm. them, get them free. That is now like a big yeah. You're so right. That is what I want in season three. That would be so much fun. The banter, the banter, and also because like a big thing that I was missing from season two was like I wanted just several moments of like Olu and Archie like locking eyes um while jim is doing something like being goofy or like being hot you know Mm. anything and just like honestly i think both of those actors could have sold me on so much of the stuff that they cut on the polycule um with just a look and i think Mm -hmm. like there's that mutual understanding of like they're so amazing and we're in this you know and like and they're good to us I would have loved to see that. I also, like, this is Jim adjacent, mm-hmm. but I wanted to see Olu uh, save Archie, like, in the mm-hmm. way that Jim does at some point. Uh, I would love to just, in a moment in the battle, just, like, a, a brief flicker of, like, him catching, or, like, you know, just something like that where, they and then they look at each other, and there's that understanding of, like, if they like you, I trust you, and we'll go from there, you know? Yeah. But there's enough, like, humor and joy between them that like it carries through so yeah yeah i just and i i, I just mm-hmm. love that they would i love that too. Over using I, I think it's such a like quintessential like poly experience to like look at your partner's partner and be like wow our partner's so hot <laughs> yes exactly that's what they needed to do yeah. they would have yeah they will <laughs> and i just really want to see what olu and archie look like as they strategize together as they meet up they have a yes. little conversation and they're, they're like okay what do we need to do to what, what's our plan and you know and jang is there and it's all like um that three three people make it a plan um i like that you know and jim's not there, there jim's like the most well he, it, 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 it's fascinating <laughs> um what uh roles would you guys like to see vico play in the future post our flag world star wars ace pilot Yes, oh Pika, put Vico in your Star Wars. <laughs> like that's that's mm. what I want. Great. And so badly, I want them as a Jedi. But then, was it was it you who floated the idea, or maybe another friend who was yeah. like, "But Vico as a Sith," and then that oh, was just yeah, so dark side Vico. They would bring it. Oh my god! So yeah, I I was thinking of them as a kick ass non binary like Jedi, which would be so awesome. But dark side Vico. Mm. yes yes mm-hmm. gonna, all my money take all my money take schedule. everything yeah uh the it's other like role that action. i would really specifically like to see vico in uh, in the near future is um audiobook narrator for my book someday <laughs> yeah <laughs> um for those who don't know vico has a very uh robust audiobook narration career as well and has done some like really phenomenal books um like the one true you and me by mk england which is fantastic um they also did um most recently, I think, uh, The Wicked Bargain um, by Gabe Cole Navoa, which is a phenomenal book for anyone who loves Our Flag Means Death. It's gay pirates. It's a it's a trans pirate book. It's amazing. I read it. Um, so, like, if you need more Vico in your life, uh, perhaps check out some audiobooks. Didn't they narrate Transmogrify as well? Oh, I didn't know that. I believe amazing. they did. Yeah. They, they did. I know they did Lake Lore um, by Anne yes. McElmore. Uh, with I think Avi Roke because it's a dual yes, POV, it's a dual POV yeah. um, who's also trans and Latinx as far as I know and yes. that was also very beautiful because I love everything that A.M. Macklemore writes uh, and you should read them too because they're very they, good I was yes, going to say they did I, th- I think by the same author one called Venom and Val that 
that on yes. the oh yeah yeah that was really 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 good um very like gym-esque kind of role kind of a gender fluid um assassin type character oh my God. um it was really it was a really cute i don't do a lot Venom of them and vow the one that they co-wrote yes it's but, yeah. Uh, right. oh, yeah. yeah 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 um sorry i have it on my like library app that i try to find i didn't know um, they did that one i have to listen to it oh my god yeah, that. Really i know it's good. yeah but yeah uh, everybody yeah. everybody get on the audiobook train and go mm-hmm. listen to everything that vico narrates because mm-hmm. excellent we should we can support them in other uh aspects of their career too and then yeah, maybe like, they'll do more and then maybe they'll yeah. do mine someday and, and mine <laughs> yeah uh, I, I would like to on my library app so if you, you know, can't afford Audible or whatever, go bug your local library. To- yeah, Libby is phenomenal. Also, if if you don't like Jeff Bezos, um, check out Libro FM, which is an alternative to Audible that is uh, an excellent independent company. And they give a cut of every sale to your local bookstore of your choice. Nice. I'd like to see uh, Vico in like a over-the-top telenovela. Yes. yes. <laughs> and just kind of get the whole silly goose like aspect out there, like, but also be like really lean into like the double crossing in the telenovelas. Like they get yes. to like play a bunch of like starkly different characters as like in 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 the same person, like same personality. Absolutely. Yes. I love it. I just want Vico in any like action role. I just think they would be a great mm. Like action character, any anything. Die Hard. Be a great- Di- Die Hard. Yeah, I wrote a Die Hard AU, and I'm like, I want him to do a reboot of Die Hard because I think we deserve an A cab. You know, Die Hard. I agree. Movie. Hell yeah. yeah! I would love to see like a like a heist. Yes. yes. Yeah. Or like mm. a like a less colonizer remake of like National Treasure or something. Yes. Like something. Yeah. Doesn't. Something that would allow Vico to do like a like cool heisty action stuff, but also They're, like flex their comedic chops. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There was another author who I haven't read it. Um, I don't even have it written down, but it's the fig is called like Be Gay Do Crime, and it's an Ocean's Eleven type. Yes, person. but yes. apparently there's a pretty big gym like story. Um, I think it's Ophelia Swims, but like with a five. Amazing Swims is the author. Um, yeah, and I've heard very good things on my to read list. I think I'd well, really uh, love to see Vico in kind of like any period piece. Yes, mm-hmm. same. like I would really love to see Vico in like some kind of like adaptation of like Jane Austen. Where That's exactly just, what I was like, gonna say. Yeah, I was gonna say like a Darcy esque heartthrob. Like I, yes. they would oh, nice. kill a grumpy antihero. Yes. I also really want to see them as a villain. I want to see them as like a really like a uh, honestly like a Jessica they Jones kill villain it as but... Mr. Wickham. Yeah, yeah, Ooh. or like exactly, or like a Victorian. Like and they yeah. would they would kill it in period pieces. They would kill it as like a really malicious villain. They would also okay. k- kill it as like a like a Victorian hero. Um, yeah. like a very dashing they have dashing energy they have like mm-hmm. horse riding sword wielding for her honor you know like energy mm-hmm. oh Would my god love to see them play so in a like years? super queer version of like camelot i, I would love to see them play Lancelot. <gasps> yeah they'd be like so they'd funny. make a great lancelot uh, yeah. um yeah. honestly i don't know if anyone uh has read this book yet but um, Gwen and Art Are Not in Love by Lex Croucher, which is a phenomenal queer historical mm. book about um, a, a prince, a princess, Gwendolyn, and her fiancé, Arthur, um, who are not in love with each other, who realize uh, they hate each other, and then they realize that they're both gay and they can help each other, like, wingman. Ooh. And it's yeah. so great, and they would make a great Arthur in that. Like, honestly, like, oh. that would be so good. Somebody adapt that and yes. <laughs> hire Vico. Yes. Not that the big Lebowski needs to be remade ever, but I would love to see Vico as the Jesus in the scene where they're in the purple jumpsuit and the bowling ball. I feel like mm, I just need yes. that moment <laughs> with Vico. Oh my god, they would Vico and Magic Mike. Like a queer Oh my god, that would be incredible. Magic yes. Mike. <laughs> That's amazing. What don't we want to see Vico in? Is the thing. <laughs> I'm like, I want to see him as a villain. I want to see them do comedy. I want to see action. I want romance. My everything. Yeah, I was Let's just go. gonna say, I just want more Vico in my life. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I just think mm-hmm. that Vico's career should be absolutely booming after this. Yeah. Yes, a million percent. And I like they have such heartthrob potential. Like, talk about like leading person looks. Like that's leading looks right mm. there. Like they have yeah. so much magnetism. 
Um, yeah, I, they have so much presence. I think they could bring Look, it. Consider we remake the Twilight films. They play all the roles. Yes. <laughs> It would probably be better. Oh yeah, I mean, Amazing. obviously. <laughs> Amazing. Also, let would see something like Izzy Hands, because, like, they clearly have a lot of, like, yeah. they want some, like, disaster Izzy energy. You know, they clearly like that. I would love to see them lean into it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was just thinking Vico as the Scarlet Pimpernel. Oh, fuck yeah. Right? I don't actually no know that. much about about the Scarlet Pimpernel. I missed oh, that. Oh, Scarlet Pimpernel that was like... is, is, like, the original superhero yeah oh. i feel like that was my first that was like teenage me like i read that book every six months it was it's very like spy you know mm -hmm. um but french revolution and you know white french aristocrats <laughs> so i yes. feel like a yeah a queer like yeah mm, queer i would also love to like, see great. go do some like shakespeare Yes. yes like can mm -hmm. you imagine vico in midsummer night's dream yes or like uh. or like in as you like it just like oh all of the gender energy like let's mm. go coming to like midsummers there was a um there was a production that i saw like a while back at uh the stratford like Sh shakespearean festival theater i'm um, in ontario um and the uh titania and oberon were both played by cis men who switched the roles mm. like every five productions or whatever they switched roles so they both and i feel like mm -hmm. vika would be fucking great in something like that like a very like yes that's interesting playing with it Vico so, as hey, benedict in much ado about nothing uh, i was about to say yes. that <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Taming yeah. of the shrew, but make it be um like uh be not awful. What is it? BDSM? <laughs> mm. <laughs> like a like a little bit kink energy. Like like way kink energy, but taming of the shrew. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. Okay, we are well over 90 minutes at this point. Um, but we, uh, we need to get into like just uh rapid fire fic recommendations. Okay, I've got some. So this is all the gem fix. Uh, pitch it to us and tell us like a little bit about what it's about. Okay, go go, Rosie. Okay, so I have two that I want to recommend. Um, okay, so the first one is The Art of Gift Giving by Nanashio7. Um, it is a, an absolutely hilarious like kind of comedy of errors as Ed and Jim are both trying to gift their partners something that will like show that they are good at relationships, but neither of them really knows like how to do this yet. And so they decide to help each other, which is just a disaster because both of them don't know how to do it. So they like go out and try to figure out what to get Oluwande and Steed. And it's just hilarious. Uh, it's so heartwarming and silly. I was laughing within like a couple of lines just absolutely pitch perfect um depiction of the crew as well it's just like very in line with the show in terms of comedy and then the other one that i want to pitch and this is like my overall pitch for like this is the fic to read like everyone read this fic nobody walk away from this fan it's from this episode not reading this fic it is a it's a it's criminally underrated um it is so good i don't know like how to breathe with it in the universe uh it like it like puts me to shame like everything i will ever write is worthless compared to this fic <laughs> it is a it, just just go with me on this i realize this is going to be like a lot of words that are maybe going to make you want to run away don't run away it is an eighteen thousand word long fanfic in second person and it is a oh, character study about? of jim called Make Your Peace with Weariness and Let It Be by Anna Rondak. And it is like literally the best piece of writing I have ever read, published or otherwise. It's unbelievable. It will just knock you off, like knock your socks off completely. It so gets to the, like the heart of Jim as a character and like who they are and why they are who they are in a way that like no other writing has ever done for any character ever, probably. Like it's just, mm. it's so impressive. I started reading I mean, it this weekend. It's very, very good. Yeah. I almost didn't read it because it was so long. I was just like, yeah. I don't know. This is a long fic and it's in second person. I don't know if I can fuck with that energy. And then I started reading it and then it was two in the morning and I was like, whoops. <laughs> I would second it as well. It's like one of my top, gym fix of all time and it's just it's it's got a really stunning weaving of catholicism through it all and uh in a way that like you know religious trauma and it's it's a really 
It's a really mm. beautiful. It's book. a hard hitter. It's so good. Yeah. Is this post season one? Yes. Uh, it is. Uh, it is actually a gym from their like childhood up to. I don't. I don't remember where. Oh, it was it yes. written? Yeah. Like post. Oh yeah. It was written post season yeah. one. Yeah. It's okay. early. Fifth. I think I have heard of this. Then I because I I sent it, it to you of- like. 40 times Maya. Okay. Yeah. It was that. Yep. It was that one. I am, yes, the- I am an evangelist about one thing and it is this fan fiction. That's what it is. Okay. Yeah. I have not read it yet. And I'm, I'm very excited. I'm just not like ready to take it on. Like, I know it's going to remake me and like, I'm, I'm still not done being remade by like the last, you know, like I'll, I'll get to it. I'm very excited. You got to read it. I've, it's yeah. so good. You've been talking about this. I've, I've been I believe- talking about this yes. since like April of what what year was it 2022 yes 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 yeah. you have i read yeah. it during my first like very big fanfic binge i i like embarked on a mission to read every fanfic there was and uh, <laughs> very and well yeah i know hilarious uh very quickly was outpaced by the fanfic i was i was doing okay for a little while there like for the first couple of months but yeah. then i had a deadline so <laughs> r.i.p and now there's like 30,000 are Yeah, no back fanfics. when I was yeah. when I was planning to do it there were like 5,000. <laughs> wow. Um oh, oh by the way this weekend I was reading your tentacle one uh <laughs> nerdy. Um so tell us about your tentacle one. The, the sure. writing is very good. I'm not like an explicit reader. Uh I but I'm like I'm going to read it because you know, I know you now and I'm like into it. And I'm like this is the writing is really great. And it, so it's great writing. It's I, I know we love. There's many people who love the, the E and the smut, and so there's that too. So really well done. But tell us about the tentacle fic. Sure. Yeah. So I write a lot of gym fic. I write a lot of smut fic. Particular, I think two thirds of like what I've published on Ao3 for <laughs> gym related stuff is is E rated. Um, partially because I did Kinktober last year, which, uh, but I like. I like Jim in rare pairs a lot. So I like writing Jim in weird pairings. Um, it's fun. This is a, oh my God, I'm like, I don't even know what it's called. The first one is called We Both Go Down Together. I think it's a series called Plumbing the Depths. Um, and it's a Jim Olu Ed threesome fix yeah. specifically where it's got like T for T, Ed and Jim. Uh, Ed is like a trans man who's also the literal Kraken with uh, tentacles of unknown origin because I don't, I don't think of things in very concrete ways. Um, But yeah, it's, you know, the Kraken fucks Jim and Olu. It's a fun fic. I really liked writing it. I don't, I'm not great at self-rec. It's fun. It's very smutty. Um, There's this follow-up and there's going to be a third part too. There's like one in each of their POVs. Um, But yeah, if you like, I don't know, gender vibes and tentacles and smut, it's maybe a fun fic for you. Um, you write a lot of rare pairs, and I I appreciate yeah. the rare pairs. And but the thing about the rare pairs is that it, you don't get a whole lot of hits. Uh, you don't um, like one one of my favorite ones that I've ever written was kind of a rare pair, and don't get a lot of hits, don't get a lot of kudos, don't get a lot of comments. But the, you know, they're I appreciate them. So so, what's your favorite rare pair to write? Yeah, it's Jim and Ed. Um, yeah. which I, I'm, and I, I feel like I should preface this by saying that I think I often separate what I want to see in fanfic by what I want to see in the actual show. And like in the actual show, I'm like, Ed and Steed should never be separated. They are a pair. They don't go apart. Uh, but I really like exploring in fic. I think Jim and Ed have such an interesting dynamic and they're like, you know, they're so similar in a lot of ways. Um, and, and they're really fun to write together either in like a romantic pairing or a non-romantic pairing. And especially to see how, you know, how would it work if, you know, if Steed and Olawande are still there and are they, are they friends with Jim? I think I have like one series where, you know, Steed is ace and arrow. And so he and Ed are in a, you know, a queer platonic relationship. That's their most important relationship. But then Jim comes in and kind of what happens then. Uh, But yeah, so I like, I read a lot of Jim and Ed. And I think, I think it's worth saying too, that a lot of like, in a fandom as big as this so you were saying like the make your peace with weariness and let it be is really underrated that's true for a lot of like gym centric fix or Mm -hmm. 
any fix that are not focused on the like the main three like yep. big three thick characters of like Steed, Ed, or Izzy. Um, so there's a lot of really really fucking good gym fanfics that are you know have like forty kudos and, yeah. or, or less less than a hundred kudos on Ao3. I will also add like I don't, maybe someone can give me some tips on this. Maybe I'm just doing it wrong. I find it very difficult to find those fix. I do have good tips on that, actually. Great. Because yeah, I find so... that, like, you search for, like, fix with gym in them, and it's like, well, it, it has gym in it, but they're, like, you know, the, the fourth like a person line. on the list. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this, I don't know if it's particular to this fandom, but there's a there's a trend, I think, nowadays where any character that shows up in a fic at all gets tagged in it, which is... Uh, if, as a fic writer perspective, not the best practice because then it draws in readers that for somebody who's not really there. Um, but my two tips for this are one, if you go into a fic and you're not sure if a character is present in it and you want to make sure they are, you just like control F search their name. <laughs> and right off the bat, if you it's a 10,000 fic and you see Jim's name is in there twice, they're not actually in the fic. They are mm-hmm. not present. So you can just back out. The other one that is in terms of like limiting what you're seeing on the AO3 page is if you go go to the AO3 filtering and you scroll all the way down. There's a part that's like uh, search within results and you can put summary colon gym and it'll find their name in the summary. And it's not a guarantee, but it's, it's that's pretty, brilliant. Yeah. It's pretty like generally if you're looking for a character or for a fic about that character, they're going to be mentioned in the summary. And that's you can do brilliant. that for any like minor character. You could do that for Frenchie. You could do that for Roach. Um, you can do that for other things as well. Like you can do, uh, you can search for that for like OTP and OT, you know, like once you're pairing, if you only wanted to find like Jim and Olu fix, you can do that. But I don't know the search function. You can find them on AO3 somewhere they're listed. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of my two like hop AO3. <laughs> yeah. And there is a tag that's like Lucius POV, Jim POV. Like you can, there is, it's just not used that. like- yeah. It's not yeah, some people don't, lot, don't remember. Well, it's it. I think it's useful. I think that like it's something that I never remember to tag my fix. So, but yeah, it's it. That, there's that one or like gym centric. I think can sometimes be like a a tag as well. I'll give a few more. Um, so a uh, kind of a recent one that just finished. That's one of my favorites. It's got a like gym and or sorry, Ed and Steed plot, and then a a Jim and Olu plot. Uh, that jumps around between POVs is called Tenderness Above All by Jack until June. It's rated E. It's basically a like Hornigold comes in as a pirate hunter and kind of takes over like uh, Ed and Steed's ship and the crew gets separated and uh, big action scenes. It's a really good fic. Uh, It's also criminally underrated. I feel like worth also mentioning that if you want more Jim Olu stuff, you can, I don't know if we share links in this, but you can share the link to like my fic recs because I have so many. Okay, yeah. Uh, Tragically Nerdy has a Tumblr list and I will share the Tumblr list in the show notes with all of the Jim recs. It's really, really good. Yeah. I just want to shout out some of my favorite authors real quick. Oh, wait please continue yes. <laughs> no 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 yeah go for, I like I think probably uh, there'll be similar ones but I think some big like Jim and Olu or like Jim centric authors are like Yerba Mansa does a lot exactly of what really, I was gonna say yeah. yeah it does a lot of really good Jim <laughs> centric stuff they have a like modern AU where Steed has like a ranch at west and Jim and Olu go and start working on his ranch that's just a beautiful like very calm series it's it's just they write lovely slice of life type stuff. Um, Olawande's Orange is another author who writes a lot of gym centric stuff. Um, beautiful work. They do a lot of uh, smut stuff and kind of play around with a lot of different ideas. They had a really good one that was based on like the bear that was a T for T gym smut series that was fucking great. It was wow. good kind of vibes. Um, and Alf Alfairy is another one who is no longer like really posting a. Uh, OFMD stuff, but they have a a beautiful, like she has a ton of really good uh, gym centric fix. Anyway, sorry, you can go now. That is awesome. And those were like most of the, especially the, those first two were exactly who I was going to name. Mm-hmm. Um, so I love that. I just also wanted to shout out, um, yeah, all one is oranges. Uh, Caribbean Crocs has also written some very sweet uh, gym Olu polycule stuff. So as an yeah. author. 
Oh, um, an absolute twat too on AO3. An absolute twat is like their her, her username. Has written some lovely gym centric stuff too. You know, there's a collection by Mint Pepper as well, and a collection by Owl and a Miner that are really good. If you're looking for like a really long post season two series, like kind of alt season two, post season two, uh, I've only read one of them, so I can't wreck the whole series. But there was an author in the Letter of Sa- Name of Sanity who wrote like 20 fix in a series. It's a beautiful long series. So that's a good one. I think one last fix that I want to kind of shout out as well. Um, I'm actually going to do two last fix. If you're looking for a really short gym ed fic that's fucking has my entire heart and soul, it's called What You Take With You, What You Leave Behind by Love With A Girl. And it's a like, the world is ending, gym and ed. It's a very short fic. It's very beautiful. Makes you cry. Um, <laughs> the other one that I wanted to, I feel like I'm just info dumping. Yes, <laughs> info <laughs> dump because we'll, we will wrap it up soon. But I just, beautiful. Any, yeah. this is the last chance to get any in that need to get in. Yeah. Um, there's one that I, it, it is actually a Frenchie fic, uh, but that has a like solid right. Frenchie gym relationship, like Frenchie in love with Olu and then Frenchie falling in love with Jim um, season two, like alt that's called transformative work by Maya Ugly and Pine Hutch. And it's, it is like one of my favorite fics of all time. It's so fucking good. It captures Frenchie in a way that I, you know, most beautifully, but it's a really, really lovely Jim, Jim, big Jim plot fic. Thank you. Okay. So we are going to wrap things up. Uh, Where can people find you and what are you working on right now? If you're working on anything, uh, Tragically Nerdy, go first. Yeah, I, you can find me on AO3 as Tragically Nerdy. I'm also on Tumblr as uh, The Tragically Nerdy and on Twitter as The Tragic Nerd. I am constantly working on fix. So I have one that should be dropping in the next week or so. That's a rare pair of Valentine's type thing. Uh, but something else worth mentioning is me and Ola Wande's Orange are kind of in the works of planning a gym, like a polycule or teal oranges prompt week that will hopefully be coming out. Hey. So keep an eye out for that. You can follow Ola Wande's Orange on, tum- on on Twitter or like myself at The Tragic Nerd. I'm not super active there, but uh, we will be posting about it when we kind of know more. Um, but that's something that we we want to do. So that's that's me. Awesome. And Rosie, what are you working on? Where can people find you? Uh, people can find me on social media uh, at Rosie Thor, uh, R-O-S-I-E-E-T-H-O-R. Um, I am working on more books and uh, more short fiction, more, more original short fiction coming soon. Um, yeah, very excited about it. Currently working on uh, a b- book for a property that shall not be named but could be easily Googled um, <laughs> that is another uh, – beloved tv show that was cut short too soon <sighs> um some some uh a, a novel is a, a novel in set in the universe uh official canon there's geese in it <laughs> you're dropping all the hints um i can't wait to shout about it in the show and we're allowed to uh shout about it but yeah the, just go rosie you're an inspiration to all of us because you show that it is possible to eventually be Look, I, a professional fan thicker i just think <laughs> that what i'm getting to do right now is uh extremely healing for my first like trauma of getting a show canceled mid-season mm-hmm. and just being like oh no, this can happen when I was like, I don't know, 12 years old or something. No, I was younger than that. And it was just, you know, it's it's one of those things where like now I get to heal my wounds because I get to add to the canon. And like maybe someday I'll get to heal my wounds from this by adding to the canon. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and Maya, what are you, where can I, where can people find you? You can find me um, on Twitter or whatever it is. And uh, Blue Sky uh, under Maya Gittleman. That's M-A-Y-A. G I T T E L M A N, um, or on Instagram at Bookshelf by Maya. Um, eventually, I will have a website. I should. I will. Um, and I also have, you know, please do follow my work on Reactor. I love to talk about um, books, TV, me- just media, and in general, it's usually QTPOC media. I'm usually talking about. 
um, stories that aren't getting covered in one way or the other or haven't been told um, before. And that's what I'm really excited to support and promote and to uh, nourish myself with. So that's what I get to write about. So you can follow my work there. That's critical work. Um, you can find me in Anthologized in Night of the Living Queers. And I have other short fiction also coming out, new short fiction in the works um, for this year. So just keep an eye out for that. We have some short um, fiction coming you. out together. Yay! Yes, we do. Mm. We'll be in the same, in some of the same projects. So keep an eye and out. And it's going to be, I will say it's going to be gay and magic. Cause it's going to be really gay. A yay. spoiler. Cause yay. it usually is. Yay, gay. Yeah. So very exciting mm. stuff. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And Tony, what are you working on? Where, where can people find you? People can find me on AO3 at Y A A U R E N S or Instagram. You can also find my nerdy jewelry type stuff at Blue Box Imaginarium on Instagram or just straight up as the website, blueboximaginarium.com. Awesome. And Carly, where can people find you? What are you working on? Hi. So I am I've been planning that thing on Tuesday in Burbank um, and trying to kind of cast a wider net of uh, folks who are also fighting for all their shows as well. So we're coming in through the momentum of Our Flag Means Death, but um, we've got Save um, Rap Shit and Julia and Station 19 and Shadow and Bone and A League of Our Own. So there's just like all, all these folks who are falling in love with these like beautifully diverse, queer, inclusive stories that are just cut short because of capitalism um, that uh, hopefully are, hopefully we can start kind of uh, coalition building and organizing so that we can kind of um, kind of face that a little bit more head 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 on. So just kind of trying to building um, building up a network of people who are interested in organizing and uh, kind of strategizing around a lot more direct action to help Fun. move this along. Yeah. So um, <laughs> so uh, let's see for Instagram, I have um, fangirl photo where you can see my photos, my videos of like just a lot of the fandom stuff, all the strike stuff that I just finished covering in the summer and the fall are on there it's f-o-t-o in espanol and then um for twitter there's the wga underscore fandom love um and that is uh that was kind of born out of wanting to figure out how to get folks who wanted to do something within the fandom um when our writers went on strike initially and then when the actors uh joined them later on um so kind of like a, a place for where fandom meets activism meets supporting the people who built up our universes um and then um the my my first twitter account is um slay and chilean but again don't follow me unless you're well over 18 lovely and if you are listening and you want to be on the show please dm me i'm at carly l heath on twitter and carly lynn heath on instagram uh, i'm always up for having more people on the show who want to talk about the best show of all time, Our Flag Means Death. And you can follow us, this podcast, at Our Flag Means Fan Fiction on Instagram. Mm-hmm.